Why don't we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word, your breathed out, authoritative, profitable word. Lord, may we have ears to hear and eyes to see. And may you behold, may we behold wonderful things in your law. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Sunday evening. We have been going through a verse or a book by book, not quite a verse by verse, book by book study of the entire Bible. And tonight we are in the book of Amos. So you can begin opening your Bibles to the book of Amos. Uh, you can go to the New Testament and go left 10 books if you can't find the, find the book of Amos. But if you're in town Thursday night, we were blessed with a thunderstorm in our neighborhood that brought some much needed rain. And as you know, th- thunder normally comes with a warning. Some people like to cover their ears as soon as they see the lightning because they know what's coming. But if you experience lightning that is so close to the thunder that it's barely imperceptible, they seem to arrive at the same time, well, that was this week. While studying, without warning, a violent, sudden, deafening thunderclap seemed to shake the whole house. And you can feel the roar of thunder reverberate in your body. That roar immediately instills fear. And for a brief moment, the thought may cross your mind that this might be the last clap of thunder I ever hear. Followed by a brief consideration of whether you're in a safe place. Okay, I'm inside. I'm not holding an umbrella. I think I'm safe. But have you ever heard a lion roar? A lion's roar can be heard from five miles away. But have you ever heard a lion roar up close? I have. And I relived it during that thunderstorm. A lion's roar up close, especially if you weren't aware of its presence, immediately induces fear. You're checking your surroundings. Okay, good, there's a fence between us. And a lion's roar is deafening. If you were repeatedly exposed over and over to a lion's roar, you would eventually lose your hearing. Well, the opening words of Amos 1-2 read, Yahweh roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he gives forth his voice. And a number of things roar in Scripture, but this particular word almost always refers to a lion's roar. And when used of God, it pictures him as a lion. And his roar produces fear. It causes the ground to shake. But above all, his roar is the sound of certain judgment. And the theme of Amos is the nature of God's judgment. Yahweh is about to roar. And as we walk through Amos, we're going to look at three characteristics of God's judgment. And the first is Yahweh's impartial judgment. And that'll be the section from chapters 1 to 2. And we'll start with the introduction. Verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he beheld in visions concerning Israel. Amos is the sheep herder. In 714, we read, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. In other words, Amos was a farmer. He wasn't a professional prophet who trained up under other prophets to be a prophet. He didn't make his living as a prophet. He was a layman from Tekoa, a village near Bethlehem in Judah. And in verse 1, we see that his words and visions are concerning Israel, that is the northern kingdom. God called this southern farmer to leave his home in Judah and go prophesy to the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom of Israel had seen other prophets in Elijah and Elisha, But Amos would be the first writing prophet to address them. And we also see in verse 1, Amos ministers of Amos' ministry, he ministered in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, the king of Israel. And Amos occurs during the reign of Jeroboam II over the northern kingdom. And a reasonable recommendation for the dating of Amos is approximately 760 B.C., a couple generations after Obadiah and Joel, and maybe a decade or two after Jonah. And it's during Jeroboam's reign, and this was the golden era of the northern kingdom, of 
because of their economic prosperity and their military might. But prosperity would lead to pride and materialism and greed, immorality, and injustice. So look again at verse 2. And he said, Yahweh roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he gives forth his voice. And the shepherd's pasture grounds mourn, and the top of Carmel dries up. Carmel is a mountain range in northern Israel that was home to the famous showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And it's normally green and lush and fertile. But at the sound of Yahweh's roar from Jerusalem, Carmel will dry up and become desolate. And how will the nation of Israel, in its prosperity, respond to Yahweh's roaring through a southern farmer? Well, in verse 3, we're introduced to the next section, which is eight prophetic judgments. And the first six judgments follow a very similar formula, and they come across Damascus and Gaza and Tyre and Edom and Ammon and Moab, all nations which surround Israel from almost every direction. And let's briefly look at the first judgment, verse 3. For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn back its punishment. And this same expression is repeated for each nation listed. For three transgressions, for four. And if sin was completely full at three sins, fully deserving of judgment, well, then they went and added a fourth sin. This isn't so much about the number of sins, but the exceeding fullness of their sin. And then let's look at some of their sins. Damascus, verses 3 through 5. They threshed Gilead with sharp iron. Gilead was the territory of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the northeast of Israel. And Damascus, at some point, had threshed Gilead's fields with iron, destroying their crops and making them unsuitable for planting, at least for a season, because of their digging up the dirt. And this was a cruel attack on the citizens' food supply, and especially brutal. It didn't just affect the army. This would have been like sowing salt on the fields of your enemies, so they could never use that field again. And then Gaza, in verses 6 through 8, and Tyr, in verses 9 through 10, they both delivered up whole populations of Israel to Edom as captives. Edom, which descended from Esau, were distant cousins of Israel, and it is said in verse 11 that Edom was guilty of pursuing his brother with the sword, apparently causing portions of Israel at some point to flee to its neighbors in Philistia and Tyre, only to be betrayed by them and handed back over to Edom as captives and slaves. And look at Moab in chapter 2, verse 1, who are said to have burned the bones of the king of Edom with fire. It would have been viewed as desecration of a body to burn it, especially the king of their own cousin nation. Remember, Ammon and Moab and Edom and Israel are all related And then scan over these seven judgments and notice the punishment that each and every one of these nations receives. In 1.4, so I will send fire and it will consume her citadels. 1.7, so I will send fire and consume her citadels. Likewise, the same punishment in 1.10, 1.12, 2.2, fire, citadels. They've all filled up their wickedness. They've sinned against Israel. They sinned against each other. So God will judge them with fire and will burn their citadels or their palaces. And there's this formula that we can see there. And as Amos reaches this point in the eight judgments, God has slowly been closing a circle around Israel. If you look at a map, every direction of potential escape from the roaring of the lion for Israel is now pictured as a blaze in God's judgment. Israel has been hemmed in from every direction but the south through Judah. Did Israel sense the trap closing in on them? Or were they oblivious and perhaps growing fond of this funny-sounding farmer from the south that pronounced judgment on all their enemies? In 2.4, we get to the seventh judgment. Thus says Yahweh, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn back its punishment because they have rejected the law of Yahweh and have not kept his statutes. Their falsehood has also led them astray, that which their fathers walked after. 
So I will send fire upon Judah, and it will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. You can almost hear a sigh of relief and maybe even delight when Amos calls out Judah. Yeah, Amos, judge them just like the Gentiles. What was Judah's sin? God will judge Judah for rejecting and disobeying his law. Because according, um, Judah had been led away. They'd been led away by idolatry. Judah's punishment, the same as the Gentile nations. God's judgment of the nations was just. Nations without God's law were culpable because according to their own consciences, they knew enough to be accountable. This is Romans 1. And God's judgment of Judah was just. Judah had rejected the special revelation of God's law. But if Judah was not exempt, neither was Israel. With fire now coming on Judah, the imagery of a potential escape route to the south from the roaring of the lion was now cut off. There is no escaping the lion's judgment. So in 2.6, we come to the eighth judgment, this time against Israel. Thus says Yahweh, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn back its punishment. It starts similar to the others, but the similarities end there. Verse 6 continues, Because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the poor, also turn aside the way of the humble, and a man and his father go to the same young woman in order to profane my holy name. On garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. And the list of sins stacks up pretty quickly. They sell or enslave the righteous to buy a pair of sandals. They commit sexual immorality at home and besides their evil altars. And they mix drunkenness with their supposed worship of Yahweh. In verses 9 and 10, God reminds them of his past provision and his protection of them as a nation in bringing them out of Egypt into the promised land. And then look at the beginning of verse 11. Then I raised up some of your sons to be prophets. And skip to the end of verse 12. And you commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Israel continued to silence the pro- God's prophets. But here was God patiently sending yet another prophet to Israel. But time was nearly out, the lion was roaring, and people plugged their ears and paid no attention. In verse 2 or 14, Amos mentions a day that was coming when Israel must flee but won't be able to escape. No matter what weapons or footwear, no matter what strength or courage he has, no matter how fast his horse, they would not escape. And in chapters 1 and 2, we actually see that God's judgment is impartial. God will hold all nations accountable for their sin. God will judge the Gentiles and he will judge his chosen people. And there are variations in judgment. Israel and Judah are held to a higher standard than their neighbors because they receive the law and the covenants. But they all alike will be held accountable for their sin. None are exempted from his judgment. His justice is impartial. And then in chapters 3 through 6, now we come to the second characteristics of God's judgment. Yahweh's just judgment. In the first section of this book, we see three messages to the people. And you can look at chapter 3, verse 1, 4, verse 1, and 5, verse 1. Each begin with the phrase, hear this word. And these serve as structural markers to mark three distinct prophetic messages to Israel by Amos. And you can imagine each of these would then be proclaimed to the people of Israel in turn. In the first message in chapter 3, we see Israel's guilt is demonstrated. Israel's guilt is demonstrated. Verse 1, Hear this word which Yahweh has spoken against you, sons of Israel against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. 
In verses 1 through 8, God seems to temporarily step back and address both Judah and Israel together, looking back at the time of the United Kingdom and before, but he will turn his focus back to Israel. God recounts his choosing of Israel. I knew you from all the families of the earth. This is intimate covenantal knowledge. But then God draws attention in verses 1 to 8 to several cause and effect relationships. The first in verse 2, why do I punish you, Israel? Because I chose you. Cause and effect. God was aiming at something, accomplishing something in his chosen people through his punishment. The next cause and effect relationship is found in verse 3. If you see two men walking together, you know they have an appointment or a destination. Men don't go for a walk together (laughs) without some objective. Women might, not men. Men need a purpose, a destination, cause, effect. The next, in verse 4, let's read that together. Does a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? Does a young lion give forth its voice from its den unless it has captured something? If you hear a lion roar, you can rest assured it is already hunted, hunted and captured its prey. And this should be chilling to Israel. God has already started to roar. And the next is like it. If you hear a young lion roaring from its den, it's probably because the adult lion has returned with their prey. And the point is obvious. If the lion is roaring, it's not without cause. And it's always bad news for the prey. Verse 5 is like it. Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? Of course not. Cause and effect. And as we saw with Israel being surrounded by the nations, the trap is set and will soon be sprung. Verse 6. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? Tremble? <laughs> a trumpet signals war. It will surely cause trembling. Next, if a calamity happens in a city, has not Yahweh done it? Don't miss this. If you see calamity, it is only because God has already acted. Cause and effect. God is sovereign over all calamity. In Amos, we read of horrible atrocity being done to Israel by the nations and horrible atrocities perpetrated by Israel. And God is sovereign over all of that. In verse 7, we see another cause and effect relationship. Surely Lord Yahweh does, not, does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his slaves, the prophets. God has consistently spoken to his people through the prophets. The very reason Amos is speaking is because God communicates. A true prophet doesn't speak unless God speaks. And this thought spills over into verse 8. A lion has roared, who will not fear? Yahweh is roaring, and he is speaking through his prophet. And what is the logical effect of his roar? Fear. And the next, Lord Yahweh has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Amos says, God has sent me. How can I help but speak? In these parallel statements, Yahweh is again pictured as the roaring lion. God's judgment is not arbitrary. He does nothing without purpose and without a reason. Cause and effect. If you see the lion roaring, if you see the trap has sprung, if you hear the prophet speaking, it's because of sin. A lion has roared, Yahweh has spoken, and he is coming to judge sin, and his judgment is just. And if you think back to the first seven judgments in chapters 1 and 2, every nation had the same components. However, Israel's judgment was missing those last two components, fire and the consumption of her citadels. And they're not actually missing. They're just found later in the book. It's because what Amos does in two or three verses for each of those nations, he does in seven chapters for the nation of Israel. And he will get to both the consumed citadels and the consuming fire before his prophecy is done. In verses 9 through 15, Yahweh calls two nations to gather together to witness against Israel's confusion and their oppression. (laughs) 
of others. Look at 3.10. But do they not know how to do what is right? Sorry, let me... But they do not know how to do what is right, declares Yahweh. These who hoard up violence and devastation in their citadels. Therefore, thus says Lord Yahweh, an adversary, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you and your citadels will be plundered. Here Amos picks up the language of the destruction of the citadels. They will be torn down and plundered because they are the very place of Israel's violence and their oppression. And notice, who will judge? An adversary, even one surrounding the land. And this will turn out in time to be the nation of Assyria, who is currently growing in strength, strength a little ways to the north beyond its nearby neighbors. But even here, the faintest glimmer of national hope appears in verse 12. Thus says Yahweh, just as the shepherd delivers from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so will the sons of Israel inhabiting Samaria be delivered. Imagine a shepherd has lost his lamb to a lion, and the shepherd fights off the lion only to rescue the piece of a leg or an ear. Well, that's what Israel's deliverance will be like. There's still a promise of future deliverance for Israel, but like a leg of lamb or an ear is no good to the devoured animal, there is little consolation for the current generation if they, if they cling to their sin. In verse 13 and 14, leave no ambiguity in the judgment that's to come. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob. Declares Lord Yahweh, the God of hosts, for on the day that I punish Israel's transgressions. Well, from there we move to chapter 4, Israel's second message, and this is Israel's pattern of obstinance. Israel's pattern of obstinance. Verse 1 Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring now that we may drink. This is a condemnation of the affluent women. The women are compared to cows. This would have been offensive, but maybe not for the same reasons as today. Bashan is a lush, fertile place in the north, full of grazing land, and the cows there didn't have to struggle for their food. These are the fat and healthy cows, the cows of plenty, and these likely were the fashionable women. These fashionable women aren't compared to cows because of appearance, but because they live lives of luxury and laziness and ease and entitlement and pleasure-seeking with no limits and often at others' expense. And in their position, these affluent women oppress the poor, crush the needy to serve their own appetites. And Amos warns of a tragic end for them. If you will live wantonly like cattle, you will be slaughtered like cattle. God is just. In verse 4, Israel's pattern of obstinance continues. Enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Wow, they sacrifice every morning and they tithe every three days? What diligent worshipers! No. Every time Israel enters the centers of worship in Bethel and Gilgal, they transgress. With every sacrifice and every offering, they sin. The entire system of worship and sacrifice in the northern kingdom was set up as a rival to true worship in Jerusalem. God is addressing something more here than mere external worship that doesn't impact their hearts. It's worse. Despite Israel seeking to hold on to some semblance of Yahweh worship, Alongside her other gods, their entire system of worship was disobedient from the beginning. 
And Amos speaks to their true motivation and their self-willed worship in verse 5. Let's read it. And you offer a thank offering also that from that which is leavened, and call for a free will offering, and then you cause them to be heard about, to be broadcast, for so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares Lord Yahweh. The problem wasn't that their worship didn't reflect their hearts. No, their external worship was an overflow of their hearts. They loved it. They did worship from their hearts, but their hearts were wicked. And in their worship, they served their own desires. They worshiped and practiced religion as they saw fit and served gods of their own making. And then in verses 6 to 13, God reminds them how he sent famine and drought and wind and locusts and pestilence and war so that they might return to him. And as you're reading that, you'll see that five times God repeats himself, but you did not return to me. God chose them and he sent punishment on them to bring about their return. But in their obstinance, they rejected him over and over again. And in 4.11, we see just a hint of that fire judgment language for Israel, but in a different form. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand delivered from a blaze. Not only did God send chastisement to turn Israel from their ways, he even delivered them from destruction. They were like a piece of burning wood in a blazing fire, and he delivered them out of that fire. The fire that God will bring on the nations, he's already rescued Israel from in their past. But they persist in their sin. And this section closes with a look at God as creator who is just in his judgment because he knows men's thoughts. Verse 13 of chapter 4. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into gloom and treads on the high places of the earth, Yahweh God of hosts is his name. Israel is not just judged for occasional or one-time sins. Israel is judged for repeated offenses before God in their oppression of the poor and needy to serve their own desires. For their self-willed worship and their continued obstinance and refusal to return to Yahweh time after time. God's judgment is just. Well, in chapter 5, we turn to the third message, which pictures Israel's neglected opportunity. In verses 1 through 17, we'll read verse 1. Hear this word which I take up for you as a funeral lament, O house of Israel. It, it's a funeral song in chapter 5, which pictures Israel as already dead. Verse 2, she has fallen, she will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she lies abandoned on her land, there is none to raise her up. The term virgin here is not being used to imply purity, but rather this is Israel who has died without a husband. She is dying without experiencing the fullness of covenant blessings. And notice she lies abandoned on her land. She's not even properly buried. But in verse 3, we see that this death will not extend to every member of Israel. Look at verse 3. The city which goes forth 1,000 strong will have 100 left. And the one which goes forth 100 strong will have 10 left to the house of Israel. Well, the loss of 90% of its population is staggering, but some will survive. But in the midst of the funeral song, look at verse 4. Seek me that you may live. Verse 6, seek Yahweh that you may live, lest he come mightily like a fire. Verse 14, Seek good and not evil in order that you may live. And thus may Yahweh, of God of hosts, be with you, just as you have said, hate evil, love good, and set justice at the gate. Perhaps Yahweh, God of hosts, may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Joseph. 
Even at their national funeral, there is still hope. Seek Yahweh. God still holds out the opportunity for the current generation to repent at the seemingly impossible last minute and turn from their sin. But Israel will neglect this gracious opportunity. In verse 16, the funeral continues and farmers and mourners hired for the funeral are wailing in the plazas and the streets and the vineyards. And then look at the second half of verse 17 of chapter 5. Because I will pass through the midst of you. In Exodus, God passed over Israel. But he passed through the Egyptians for judgment. And now it is Israel whom he will pass through. Verse 17 concludes the three messages. And in 518, we see the beginning of the next section of woeful destruction. Woeful destruction, which will bring us to the end of chapter 6. And at the beginning, we see in verse 18, we see the first of two woes against Israel. Let's read together uh, verse 18. Woe, you who are longing for the day of Yahweh. For what purpose will the day of Yahweh be to you? It will be darkness and not light, as when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him, or he goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of Yahweh be darkness instead of light, even thick darkness with no brightness in it? Amos warns Israel, who seems to have been longing for the day of Yahweh, Don't they know know that there's no escape from a lion? And if they get away, the bear is going to find them. And if they get away from that and they get to their house, they're going to get bit by a snake. There's no escape the day of Yahweh. But why would they have been longing for the day of the Lord to begin with? Well, at this point in time, only Obadiah and Joel had spoken of the day of the Lord by that name. And Obadiah first spoke of it being a day of punishment on all nations and on the Goyim, as well as an escape for those in Jerusalem. So based on this, Israel might have thought, well, the day of Yahweh is just a matter of judgment on Edom and the nations, and it's a day of rescue for Israel and Judah. However, they were seemingly ignorant of, or more likely had rejected Joel's teaching that the day of the Lord was universal in scope, and it included both Israel and Judah. So Amos corrects their thinking, don't you know that this day will be darkness for you, not light? Israel needed to fear this day of Yahweh. They're not exempted from this future day of of punishment. And then in verses 21 through 27, God says, I hate your feasts and assemblies. I won't accept them. Remove them from me. Take them out of my sight. And then verse 24, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What they need is an overflowing manifestation of justice and righteousness and moral integrity. They cannot seek God without seeking good and hating evil. Well, in chapter 6, the second woe is about to begin, and this section is addressed to the leading men of Israel. He'd previously addressed the leading women, the cows of Bashan, and now he addresses the men who were guilty of self-styled worship, serving their own pleasures and doing as they please, not caring what effect it has on the nation's citizens. And so in chapter 6, verse 1, they are the distinguished men of the first of the nations. So in verse 7, since they love to be first, like Diotrephes, they will be first. The first to go into exile. And then in verses 8 through 14, we read of the certainty of God's judgment and the extent of God's judgment. And we read of the pride of their people and their own strength, their narcissism. So in verse 14, God says, Behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you. Assyria is not named, but their arrival is imminent. And that brings us to the the final section of the book, chapter 7 through 9, Yahweh's measured judgment. Verses 
We've seen that Yahweh's judgment is impartial, it is just, and in this third section, Yahweh's judgment is measured, or it is balanced. And the first part of this section is four visions. And in these four visions, you see mercy and justice. In 7.1, we see the first vision. It's a vision of locusts devouring the vegetation. And you can read there, Amos prays and God shows mercy and relents from the punishment. In 7.4, we get to the second vision. He shows Amos a vision of the long-anticipated judgment of fire that was to come upon Israel. Chapter 7, verse 4 For the Lord showed me, and behold, Lord Yahweh was calling to contend with them by fire, and it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. Israel is now judged just like the nations. But as with the first vision, Amos prays, and God again shows mercy and relents. God's mercy is on display in these first two judgments, these first two visions. But in the next two visions, God's justice is on display. Chapter 7, verse 7, Amos sees a vision of the Lord standing beside a wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the plumb line would be used to ensure that a wall was straight. God is there to measure Israel. So look at verse 8, chapter 8, verse 8. I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will pass over them no longer. Sound familiar? The high places of Isaac will be desolated and the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. And then I will raise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And what two objects get special mention as not measuring up? Their high places and their sanctuaries both being locations of their self-styled, syncretistic, idolatrous worship. And after Amos relays this third vision to Israel, in verse 10 we see the false priest, Amaziah, take objection to Amos' message. Well, first we see Amaziah twists Amos' words and says to Jeroboam, Amos said you will die by the sword and Israel will go away into exile. And this was, a, this was a partial truth. Jeroboam's house would die by the sword, but Amos did not say Jeroboam himself would die. But the second part was true. Israel would certainly go into exile. Amaziah then commands Amos, go back to Judah, stop prophesying. Israel wanted to silence the prophet, to muzzle the lion as if plugging their ears and hoping his roar would stop. In Amos' response, we read earlier, I don't prophesy because I'm a professional or trained prophet. This isn't even my livelihood. I'm a farmer. I prophesy because God commands me to. And then in chapter 8, we get to the fourth vision This is the vision of summer fruit. And in the summer, fruit is ripe and it's ready for consumption or it's ready for disposal. And as the fruit is ripe and ready to be consumed, God's people are ripe and ready to be judged. And in 8.2 comes the repeated phrase, I will pass over them no longer. The time for mercy is over. Now is the time for justice. And in verses 5 and 6, we see God's commands have actually become nothing but an inconvenience to the people from pursuing their own self-interest. And now skip ahead to verse 11. Behold, days are coming, declares Lord Yahweh, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of Yahweh. We should all hunger for God's word. But you don't want to hunger like this. They are dying of hunger and thirst for God's word because they can't find it. Because they're being judged. Time after time, they've silenced and rejected the words of the prophets. They've stood too long near the piercing roar of the lion, not heeding it. 
so that its piercing sound has deafened them so that they can no longer hear and respond to God's word. And just as they have silenced the prophets, God will cause the prophet's voice to cease from among them. God's justice is not arbitrary. It is both measured and balanced. In his judgment, he perfectly demonstrates both his mercy and his justice. Well, now we get to chapter 9, and we see a different vision. And in this vision, we again see the balanced or measured judgment of God, and we see punishment and restoration. Punishment and restoration. Verse 1 of chapter 9, I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Strike the capitals so that the thresholds will quake and break them on the heads of them all, and then I will kill the rest of them with the sword. Not one of them who can flee will flee, and not one of them who can survive will escape. Nobody will be able to flee, and those who survive cannot escape. What will happen to the survivors? Verse 4, And though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword that it will kill them. Many of the survivors will go into captivity, and many of them will still die by the sword there in captivity. And look at verse 8. Behold, the eyes of Lord Yahweh are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not destroy totally the house of Jacob, declares Yahweh, for behold, I am commanding. I will shake the house of Israel among all nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, but not a pebble will fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people will die by the sword. Just as no pebble passes through a sieve, no skinner No sinner will escape who denies God's coming judgment. The one who denies God's judgment will still experience it. No matter how tightly they've plugged their ears and ignored the lion's roar, judgment is coming. But even in this, there is hope. He says he will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. And when God shakes a sieve over all the nations, the grain will pass through, and a small remnant even of the northern kingdom, will be dispersed among the nations. And then in verse 11, there's a shift from the coming near judgment by Assyria to the time of the future restoration of scattered Israel. God will punish Israel, but he will also restore them as he promised. Look at verse 11. In that day... I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the ancient days, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares Yahweh who does this. God will raise up the fallen booth of David, or the tent of David. And why a tent? Why not the house of David here? Well, Amos is presenting Israel at the time of their future gathering as living the same way that they were living in the wilderness, wandering in tents. And this is, this has ramifications for how we understand Israel today as still wandering in exile until the future restoration. But notice in this restoration, there are six elements here in in Amos 9 that I just want to quickly call your attention to. In verse 11, we see the restoration of the Davidic dynasty. In verse 12a, we see Israel ruling over its ancient enemy, Edom, and the nations. And then at the end of verse 12, we actually see salvation of the nations. In verse 14, we see the restored fruitfulness of the land of Israel. When the reaping can't even be finished by the time it's time to begin planting and sowing because of the bountifulness of the harvest. In verse 11 and 14, we see the rebuilding of the desolate cities of Israel. And then in verse 15, we actually see the permanent settlement in her own land after their return. And all of these components speak to a glorious restoration of Israel where Abrahamic and Davidic promises will be fulfilled. But before Israel could experience this future, they would first go into exile. 
And then after that, that future day of the Lord must also come. Yahweh's judgment is measured, displaying both mercy and justice, both punishment and restoration. Israel deserves punishment and they will experience it. And God is faithful to his promises and he will keep them and one day restore his people. So what do we, what do we learn from the book of Amos? Well, we learn of the dangerous temptation to pride and self-interest if God has given us a measure of prosperity. Your prosperity is a gift from God, not, a, not of your own doing. Steward that provision in service of his gospel purposes. We learn God cares for his people when they suffer at the hands of others. And he will hold oppressors accountable and will right all wrongs. And we learn that God cares for those who suffer at the hands of his people. He cares about your sin and how you treat others. He is concerned for justice, love good, hate evil. Well, if you belong to God, his chastisement is to bring you to repentance. Return to him. and Be on short accounts with your sin. Amos is also a warning to those who chase self-stylized worship and self-made religion. In your worship, maybe on a Sunday morning at Grace Bible Church, do you seek to please yourself and your own desires and your own preferences? Or do you seek to please the Lord and to serve His body, the church, in laying down your preferences? In Amos, we're reminded that sin will render us dumb and deaf and blind to the truth. It will cut us off from the voice of God, from the lion's roar. And God is patient. But there is a limit to his patience. And don't be caught in his judgment. Seek the Lord now and live. And also be watchful over your own hearts when you recognize a decreasing desire to hear God's word. Confess that to the Lord. Seek him. I want to look at one more lesson. Turn back to Amos chapter 9, verse 4. And we'll read the whole verse this time. If you notice, I skipped over the last half of it. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it will kill them. And I will set my eyes against them for evil and not for good. Amos doesn't try to get God off of the hook here. It's easy to say that God uses evil to accomplish good, but Amos goes further than that. Here, God not only uses evil, he intended this evil to occur. Just as God's mercy and justice are not at odds with one another, neither are his goodness and his intention that evil would occur. If your view of God doesn't have room for God intending evil, not for the sake of evil, but for the accomplishment of his good purposes and his own glory, well, then we need to allow Amos to inform our view and worship of God as absolutely sovereign. God intends for evil to occur, not as an end in itself, but to accomplish the ultimate purpose of his own glory. And in such a way that he cannot actually be charged with the one doing evil. God's sovereignty over evil and man's responsibility for his own evil is displayed vividly at the cross. Listen to Isaiah 53.10. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. God the Father purposed to crush Jesus, his son, and cause him grief. God intended for this evil to occur so that he might be glorified in bearing the sins of many. Acts 2.23, I'll read it. This man, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of lawless men and put him to death. How was Jesus delivered over crucifixion? By the predetermined plan of God. By God's plans, his intentions, his purposes. 
How was Jesus delivered over to crucifixion? By the hands of lawless men who put him to death. If you are in Christ, this is sweet news to you. God is just, and we deserve his justice poured out on us. We can't read about God's justice and not think of the justice that we deserve. But God has chosen, despite our rebelliousness, to demonstrate his mercy towards us. How? By intending evil done to his son Jesus Christ on the cross. All according to his sovereign plan so that Jesus would bear the penalty for our sin. So that we could find ourselves in Amos 9.12 and be counted among those from all the nations who are called by the name of the Lord. All to the praise of his glorious grace. God spoke in the past through prophets. And Jesus continues to speak to us as our Bibles are open and read. And if you are in Christ, thank him that in his sovereignty, he opened your deaf ears to hear the voice of that lion and gave you life. Chris is going to come up and we're going to sing one more closing song. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have seen fit to call us from the nations by your name and that you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear. In your name we pray.